Hello and welcome to the India China Scholars Dialogue. Our guest today is Dr. Lao Chun Hao. Dr. Lao is one of the finest researcher on South Asian regional issues, especially India China relations. He is a deputy director and research professor at Institute of South Asian Studies at the China Institute of Contemporary International Research, that's called CISE. He was also a visiting fellow at Institute for Defense Services and Analysis in New Delhi. Dr. Lao is a prolific writer. His latest book is Indian Businesses Houses Political Influence. Welcome to the dialogue, Dr. Lao. Uh, uh, Mr. Sakim. Dr. Lao, in this dialogue, we will discuss contours of India-China relations and contemporary bilateral issues. India and China having centuries-old relationship and exchanges through religion, culture and, and business. Actually, the exchanges and engagements have rather increased multifold uh, since year 2000. But there has always been an element of misperception and mistrust between them. Why there is such a mistrust and that too persisting for such a long time? I think there are many factors. Uh, well, uh, the first, uh, the most fundamental factor is of, uh, the, the broad issue. I think all the, the shadow of the broad dispute. Because when we describe the bilateral relationship between China and India, we usually summarize several T's to, dis to define them, to describe the relationship, such like the territory, Tibet, the third party, or trust deficit, etc., but or trade deficit. But I think that the broad issue or territory issue is the most fundamental, or the, it's closely interlinked with the, with the other aspects. So particularly the 1962 war, I think it, uh, uh, the shadow, I think affects the, uh, the two countries' public opinion towards each other. And uh, the second factor, I think, is the media. Media is quite important uh, in shaping the public opinion. Just to take an example, I think that uh, uh, last year after the uh, Taiwan standoff, Actually, if we look at the media, both in China and India, I think that uh, there are many negative, uh, negative reports or ne neg negative uh, comments towards each other. And uh, well, it's, it will definitely affect the government's policy to much extent. It, it's, it's in uh, the situation, I think, is uh, both the same, both for China and uh, India. So I think that when we talk about uh, uh, communicate with the Indian counterparts, we always emphasize that the importance of the media in shaping the public opinion. And I also follow closely with the, uh, uh, the Indian media's reports or some actually some uh, public opinion. I think it's definitely uh, seriously in, uh, shaped by the media. And sometimes the media always views the bilateral relationship from a specific narrow perspective. The third factor, I think that now is also becoming more and more important is the third party factor. So the part, uh, it means that actually, uh, when we talk about the bilateral relationship, actually, we become more and more uh, tentative to view the bilateral relationship through the, through the third party uh, perspective or affected by the third party factors. For example, I remember that actually, uh, one former uh, Indian, uh, very senior diplomat has said that actually the India's Pakistan issue, in essence, is Chinese issue because with China support, Pakistan becomes an Indian issue. And from Chinese side, I think that the same happens. That is, we think that now the India play cards or, or make use of the China-US uh, China competition. So we think that uh, we, our bilateral relationship is also affected by the India US cooperation, particularly defense and security cooperation. I think that, uh, so I think the board issue, uh, the media issue, uh, the media, and also the uh, third party issue uh, plays, uh, is quite important in shaping uh, the bilateral perception recently. As you mentioned, that border is a main contentious issue between the two countries. But border issues was always there. However, the frequency and intensity of border incidents have increased lately, especially post 2015 and 16. So what happened now that we are becoming more and more aggressive towards each other? What could be the reason for the increased border conflict? Is it the leadership issue 
uh, or the regional uh, geoeconomics and and politics or that both countries are becoming more nationalist i mean there is a talk about third party role in our bilateral relationship also and more importantly the role of media has become very vocal indian media was always very vocal but lately even chinese media has also become very vocal so what has changed now i think that uh, uh, just now you have mentioned many factors which which itself means that the ball issue is quite complicated quite complex so i think that actually china and india we already made many efforts in maintaining the peace and the tranquility of the border we have already uh, set up the uh, special representatives mechanism and we already set up the wmcc mechanism and also the commanders dialogue etc and also we signed several treaties uh, or agreements such like uh, 1993 or 1996 uh, uh, agreements to maintain to try to maintain the peace and the stability or tranquility of the body or, or, uh, around the board and uh, actually also we made some progress so when before the uh, last year's incidents or the uh, doctrine uh, standoff incidents in 2017 actually we usually uh, talk to indian friends that our our board line is the most peaceful disputed board line in the world but but just as you mentioned during the past few years i think the intensity of the standoff becomes more and more serious i think there are several reasons uh first i think that of, the, of course there's a technical level technical level means that uh, with both china and india the capacity to improve the infrastructure both china and india improved we have we are more capable uh in in how to say in push forward the infrastructure uh, uh upgrade upgrade around the board area so it makes more accessible for our troops to patrol there and of course there are also some new issues such like the use of uh uav um, uh, um, uh, uh, I, I think this kind of the new technological issue also will affect some kind of the uh, situation. But of course, there are also more important that is strategic perspective. Uh, just now, you also mentioned that is from Chinese side at least. I think that we are really concerned. Indian side is becoming is becoming more and more assertive. If we not use the aggressive, more and more assertive attitude towards uh china on the board issue we, if we compare the current situation with the 19 with the situation before the 1962 i think there are many similarities at least i think that uh, maybe indian side think that now is a time for india to uh take more uh assertive uh, action to to so that uh, india can gain some kind of advantages because china is faced the competition China is faced the pressure of the uh, U.S. sides, so I think that uh, this is one factor. But from, of course, India side also think maybe China now become more and more assertive. Such that they, they will, you will combine this with the issue like the South China Sea issue, etc. I think this kind of uh, misperception exists. But I think that the, the logic uh, during past few years, the most uh, incidents happened in the Western sector in the western sector and china uh, enjoys advantages so we will not change the status quo it's the uh, the other sides that maybe want to gain more attention uh, more, more advantage uh, uh just now you also mentioned the media or the nationalism i think it's quite also very important uh, these years when we talk with the uh, communicate with indian friends you always say that the media is open etc but i think that uh, media is open is understandable now chinese media or social media is also very uh active but i think open does not mean that we should make false adjust false uh, reports or some kind of the inciting nationalism take just that we compare the china and the india uh official media i mean not social media maybe of course you think that the india maybe not have the official media of course the mainstream media mainstream media you will notice that actually after last year's incidents, we try to maintain some kind of mature or low profile attitudes. But look at the 
uh, in the media side, actually, I think that uh, the, it the tried to incite nationalism. When I watch the TV, India TV, or read the Indian newspaper, there are too many reports on this issue. And actually, it will become some obstacle for Indian government to settle the issue under the table with the Chinese side. So I think this, uh, uh, but, but of course, the Chinese side, the social media this year is, is also quite active. And it will also make some kind of pressure for the Chinese government. So I think that the uh, uh, more uh, mature part, uh, attitude is that uh, let the dispute to the uh, to the official level because they have no more information because they are more reasonable or logical and then they, they can settle the issue from more uh, uh, grant uh, or uh, bilateral relationship perspective. Galwan incident last year has left India-China relations at the lowest. We in India are intrigued by the Galwan incident itself and also the timing of it. 2020 was a chaotic year for the whole world due to pandemic and especially China where you were having this ongoing trade war with the USA. Uh, there was some unrest in Hong Kong and increased activity in Indo-Pacific keeps you occupied. On Indian side, we were struggling with COVID and actually were in no position to put any aggressive posture towards China. Uh, we have read and, and heard Indian version of Galwan incident. But we would like to know the Chinese version of why Galwan happened. Thanks for the question. Actually, this question is also many Chinese scholars are raising why this happened because uh, I think that uh, 2019, uh, uh, 2019, actually the second uh, China and India summits, informal summits, actually uh, we have, uh, the, the two countries have very good, the two leaders have very good uh, and frank exchange of views. I was interviewed by some Chinese media and I, I think that I make some very good uh, positive uh, assessment of our bilateral relationship. But last year, the, the Galwan incident happened and the overall bilateral relationship is just uh, moving to, uh, falling to the lower level. Everyone, I think both in China and India, we are asking why this happened and what are the impacts. But I think that the direct course is quite clear and the Chinese side, uh, we published, we released the uh, video footage to, uh, I think that uh, after uh, maybe this February, to my knowledge, uh, after the uh, the, two, uh, the troops dis uh, disengagement, I think because that time maybe the uh, public opinion become more sober and more calmed. So I think we reviewed, uh, we released the, uh, the uh, video footage this year. So the direct course is quite clear that is the Indian troops crossed the line but this happened, just also you mentioned, this happened maybe many times, but the most serious cause, I think that from Chinese side is quite concerned is that the Indian side violently attacked the, 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 the commanders and soldiers, the Chinese commanders and soldiers sent to negotiate. If you look at the video, you can see that the Indian troops are well equipped, armed, but the Chinese commander and soldiers and interpreter sent to negotiate. They, they didn't wear the uh, armor. They are unarmed. They didn't bring any kind of the stickers or etc. So I think that uh, chi what China is very angry is that uh, according to Chinese philosophy, that's one Chinese proverb. That is, which means that even if two countries were at war, we should not attack or kill the envoys or the ambassadors, envoys. So I think that the way, what makes China is very angry is that where the Ch Indian side has already changed the code of conduct, the way of dealing with the standoff. And that's another incident that is in the later, uh, late August last year. And I, I think that the Indian media also report this incident. That is the Indian troops opened the fire of course, it's open fire to the uh, to the air, but it's also quite dangerous. So I think that the, we are really in, concerned where the Indian side changed 
the way or the code of conduct in dealing with the standoffs around the borderline. If you look at the, some high leaders in the, from Indian government or even the military, Indian military, it's quite uh, alarming. I mean, they made some kind of the very uh, hawkish remarks. So I think this is uh, quite more, more, more dangerous than the cause it is, itself, because we think that uh, the cause, just like you can, just like you have mentioned, there are many standoffs, but usually we just can disengage peacefully through the negotiation or the discussion of the commanders or the flag uh, office dialogue, etc. But last year's incident, the most serious, uh, we are concerned about whether the Indian side changed the way of con conduct uh, in, in, in dealing with the standoff. The other more important cause, or also the effect, is that uh, we are concerned that the Indian side, uh, at least maybe the government, linked the board issue with the other, with the bilateral, overall bilateral relationship, such like the economic uh, issue. And also there are some reports, it confirmed the reports that uh, uh, U.S. has provided some kind of intelligence uh, support to Indian side in dealing with the uh, incident. So I think this makes the issue more and more complicated. Actually, maybe at a ground level, it's just a standoff. But because of so many factors are in, in, involved, the U.S. factor, the media, the nationalism, and also maybe uh, both for China and India, we cannot uh, easily disengage because of the domestic pressure, particularly last year because of COVID-19 actually both governments mainly face many challenges and no one wants to show that the, uh, how to say, lack of encouragement or etc. So I think that these kind of factors interlinked, interwined together. So, so you are saying that it was merely another border conflict. Uh, which has happened between India and China so many times before. It's declaring Ladakh as a union territory or India playing an active role in Indo-Pacific or, or reviving Quad. Okay, I think that the just uh, the border issue is, a, uh, is one of the most uh, fundamental and sticky issue. But also, of course, if we view our bilateral relationship, border issue is just one part of the bilateral relationship. And it's, it affects the other, uh, the other aspects of the bilateral relationship. And of course, the other aspects of the bilateral relationship also affects the board issue. For example, just like uh, so that I think that, uh, for example, the economic issue, just take the economic cooperation as an example. Economic cooperation actually is uh, uh, we both we, we made much progress in our bilateral economic cooperation. But uh, last year, we see that uh, there's some kind of chance that Indian sides will try to securalize securize the economic cooperation, the banning of the APPs, uh, the, the biased investment policy, etc. So maybe it's effect, the body issue is the, uh, is the cause. But actually, this kind of effect will also affect Chinese perception, where the Indian side has changed its uh, previous stand on the economic cooperation. Because when our President Xi visited India, we emphasized Development uh, partnership is the core of our bilateral strategic cooperation. And in Chennai, the two leaders agreed to set up some kind of a, a new a new mechanism to promote our bilateral economic cooperation. So we are also become more and more concerned where the Indian side has, has uh, changed its uh, uh, previous attitude towards economic cooperation. After the 1988, actually bilateral relationship there are some kind of framework which make sure, which assure that our bilateral relationship is more and more mature. That is, we stick to the strategic autonomy. We decoup de uh, decoupling the border issue with the bilateral relationship issue. We focus on the economic cooperation because both countries are the two developing countries, largest developing countries. But uh, maybe last year's incident proof the, all this kind of framework, a great framework, needs some kind of reform or, or some kind of the change. Because now the overall bilateral strategic circumstance has changed. And the domestic situation, both China and India, also changed. 
So I think that the body issue is quite important, but also there are some other other uh, areas. Yes. Uh, you know, Mr. Modi and Mr. Xi, both are very strong and popular leaders. Having all the authority to take decisions, they have met each other, I think, 18 times. They seem to have developed some kind of a chemistry between them. However, Wuhan and Chennai informal summits were a watershed events. Then why summits could not achieve anything to strengthen bilateral relationships? That just now you mentioned uh, uh, when you raised the first or second question, you mentioned the issue of the uh, uh, the factor of the leadership. I think that uh, from my to my knowledge, Chinese leadership really wants to have good or positive relationship with India. We have emphasized several times, and because we think that uh, we can choose friends, but we cannot choose neighbors. And China, for, both for China and India, we as two largest developing countries, this identity as two largest developing countries provide so much, it makes it quite necessary for both China and India to take some kind of cooperation. But I'm not sure, quite sure whether the Indian side also share the same consensus. Even if, just now you mentioned, the Indian side, Indian leadership also shared this kind of the consensus. Maybe then it, the issue will be the tactical or tactical issue or grand issue. So back to the Galwan incident. I think if it's just because of the frontier commander, because he, his personal decisions to cross the line or to attack, to, to take some kind of violent actions, it's under, maybe the bad effect will be limited. It, at least it means that the, the leaders they are quite sober, they are quite reasonable, pragmatic. So I think, but if it means that the Indian side, the, the, the leaders' strategic view on the Chinese, or on the bilateral relationship, or on the board issue changed, it will be quite dangerous. So just like, just like I've mentioned just now, last year, when Indian some senior leaders, both bureaucratic leaders and also the uh, the, the leader from the military makes some very hawkish remarks. It's quite dangerous because you look at the Chinese side, the officials are quite restrained. Back to your question, back to your question, I think that uh, uh, the, the, the two leaders' consensus is quite important, but the, the, the tactical level, ground level, we should also try to improve our communication, to improve our uh, uh, bilateral trust. As you mentioned that uh, Chinese leadership wishes to have good and positive relationship with India. Uh, I'm sure that Indian leadership also wants to have a good relationship uh, with uh, China. Uh, you know Mr. Modi, he was very keen to develop friendly relationship with all its neighborhood, uh, especially with uh, China, since he, won, he was a um, chief minister uh, of Gujarat. Uh, you must have noticed uh, his neighborhood initiatives uh, in the beginning of his term as a prime minister. But there is always a feeling in India that China only talks about India-China cooperation and friendship, but does not really uh, walk the talk. Uh, Chinese do not support India uh, at international fora such as uh, UNSC membership or NSG, or even they are reluctant uh, to, to sanction Azhar Masood as a, as a terrorist because uh, Pakistan is, is involved in it. Uh, moreover, on any international issues of war, you, you, you hyphenate India with Pakistan, uh, such as uh, joining uh, SCO. It took us 13 years to join SCO because you were hyphenating it with Pakistan. So it, it seems like uh, China links our bilateral relationship with, with Pakistan or any other international issues. It does not really remain a purely bilateral issue. Uh, what will you say to it? Quite serious uh, misunderstanding from Indian side towards uh, uh, China. I think that from Indian side, maybe it's understandable. But uh, from Chinese side, I want to mention that actually the, the issues you mentioned just now, whether it's SEO, uh, UN Security Council, or the NSG, etc., is about the multilateralism. So from Chinese perspective, I think that multilateralism is not country-specific multilateralism. So 
just now in this year's Indian side also mentioned uh, uh, a lot about the reformed multilateralism. So Chinese side, I think we agreed that we should stick to, uh, we should push forward the reformed multilateralism because we also suppose, we also suppose that actually India should and can play much, a much larger role in the international forums because India is a rising power because you have more uh, advantages in communicating between the developing countries with the developed, developed countries. But the issue is that when we talk about specific questions, as issues, I think that we, I, Chinese view on the multilateralism is that it should not be uh, strict to some country specific, such like in, whether India or Pakistan. So, for example, the, uh, the membership of the uh, United, uh, United Security Council, I think that we support the reform of the UNSC. And then we also support that the developing countries should have much voice in the decision making mechanisms in the UN. But it's quite complex. It's not one, just a con one country, India. Today's India. So, tomorrow, which country? So, we should have some kind of package solution. Also, the same uh, applies to the NSG issue. So, India is uh, now is a non NPT, uh, non proliferation treaty, non NPT uh, country. So, I think there's no uh, example of the non NPT country to join the NSG. So, if we want to admit or support India's uh, entry into the NSG, we should not make it just an Exempt, exempt, exempt for India. We should have some kind of overall principles, overall principles that uh, maybe we can open the door, but we should set up this kind of uh, principles, and then we can decide which country should join the NSG. So I think that we should make the multilateralism not on one country specific. Other, other, otherwise, it will make some uh, cause effect because the other countries also may raise the issue that you should make some kind of exempt for me. So it will be, uh, so actually this is not democratic and the rule of ba rule based. So we, we actually the rule of law, it means that we should have some kind of these principles. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a strong view among a section of people in India uh, that China is pushing India towards uh, USA with its aggressive posturing on, on, on border and with its action in India's neighborhood, uh, which is basically South Asia. Uh, you know, India believes and practices uh, non-alignment. India did not have any strong relationship with USA uh, all this while. Uh, we were very close to uh, USSR historically. Uh, India wanted to be close to China. There were talks about Asian century where India and China will work together but all these talks have gone now uh, because they feel that China is not sensitive enough about India's concern over its border or, or about its neighborhood and undermining uh, India's status internationally. In my own capacity, I think because I'm trying to do my best to promote the bilateral friendship. So I'm I had uh, I have to first emphasize that, that it's really I feel really sorry that when I read the Indian scholars' comments on the bilateral relationship, particularly after last year's incident, the, the the overview opinion is quite negative. And some Indian friends also maybe also emphasize that that the China has lost India strategically overall. So I think this kind of negative comments, of course, it's understandable from that point of view. But for me, I think it's it quite. I feel quite sorry of this. But if you from if you look at the Chinese side, you will notice quite opposite opinion, because from Chinese side we think that it's not China pushed India to the U.S. side, but actually India choose to tilt towards the Indian side, because it's unreasonable and illogical for China when we faced the strategic pressure or competition from the U.S. and then we push the Indian side to the, uh, to the U.S. side because now we need more friends. So it's, it's, it's illogical 
and uh, in a quite uh, not pragmatic way for China. But for, on the other side, I think it's quite logic that the uh, Indian side may think now is quite it's a good opportunity, golden opportunity for India to uh, make use of the China U.S. competition. And uh, because of China and India, we have so many issues unsolved. So maybe it's it's good for India to tilt towards the U.S. to 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 argue for more support. More defense and or, or financial sport, business support from Indian side or from U.S. side, and on the main on the same time to maintain good relationship with China because you think that China is still needs India. So I think that this is more logical way. But what we what uh, most important is that both China and India we should stick to the non-aligned foreign policy. Otherwise, both China and India we are big countries we are rising countries we should not make our foreign policy hijacked by the third parties if you look at the history if you look at the history i think for both and china we have already had many lessons on this issue when your foreign policy when your policy follows the other powers sealed you will suffer in the long time so I think that the, both for China and India, we should have this kind of clear understanding. You know, India is a non-aligned country and it values its strategic independence and it will remain so whatever the circumstances. And surely India will find a way to cooperate with China. Now, let me ask a question related to the new initiatives. Uh, how does China view India's role in Indo-Pacific framework? And now you have a new uh, setup called Quad. What will be its impact on India-China bilateral relations? That you've, just now you've mentioned the word framework. I, I really appreciate it. You didn't mention the Indo-Pacific strategy. So yeah. I, I think it's uh, really, really, I really appreciate it. the word such like the framework or vision or outlook. I think it's more acceptable and more uh, natural. Uh, as India's role in the Indo-Pacific framework, I think that uh, it's quite natural. India should play and can play a much larger role in the Indo-Pacific framework because it's quite natural extension of the Indian's interest and influence from the South Asia to the Indian Ocean region and also to the Indo-Pacific region. Just like the same, it, it's quite natural for China, for China to extend its interest and influence I mean, from the near neighborhood to more uh, far neighborhoods or far areas, it's quite natural. No country can stop. China cannot stop in this extension of the interest. And also from the other side and the perspective is that I think that India's vision of the Indo-Pacific to much extent is the scenery of, the, uh, of some kind of policies India has already taken or has already taken such like the local east or active east policy, such like the saga, security and growth for all in the neighbor, such like the uh, 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 think west or link west or think west. So I think that uh, India's vision of the Indo-Pacific framework to much extent is a scenery of this kind of uh, policies you already you are already undertaking. But you over mentioned, you also mentioned the word card. I think this is most, uh, I think that the worrisome for China or for uh, bilateral relationship. Actually, it's not uh, the India's role in court will not only affect the China-India relationship, it also affects the India-Russia relationship. And I think that the Russia uh, foreign minister has already conveyed this clear, this message to the Indian counterpart very clearly, because from both China and India's perspective, court it's not the overall, uh, it's not the, uh, the, the essence of the overall uh, Indo-Pacific framework. It's not a really inclusive. So I think the court, uh, if it's limited to the humanitarian relief aspects, is understandable. But if we try to make court as some kind of ideology driven and, uh, and emphasize the security, defense cooperation and uh, uh, and uh, not inclusive, I think it will affect our bilateral relationship because 
just like I've mentioned just now, although Indian side has emphasized several times that India will not be aligned or ally, any country's ally, but you also mentioned that you are multi-alignment, strategic autonomy. So we are also concerned that maybe the words, it's, the words has to be uh, in compliance with the deeds. So, so, so I think that uh, we are also concerned. For example, the uh, India and the US or has already signed the three fundamental defense cooperation agreements. So, what's the meaning? What it, it will send wrong signals because India does not need in does not in need US defense support in tackling domestic issue or the neighboring challenge. So, what's the meaning of this kind of uh, the, the the US India? defense cooperation. So we will be concerned. So I think that uh, India's role in the Indo-Pacific framework, I think is understandable and it's quite natural. Uh, to my knowledge, I accept it. But I really concerned that uh, India's Indo-Pacific framework will be hijacked by U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy. That is, and the quite important pillar for U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy is the Quad. Chinese State Councilor Wang Yi has, and Foreign Minister Wang Yi, uh, maybe last year has emphasized that uh, Quad is some kind of the Indo-Pacific NATO. So I think that uh, we suppose India's role, a uh, much role, uh, a, a, a larger role in the uh, Indo-Pacific region. But we are really concerned about the uh, about the scope and the areas of India's cooperation with the uh, within the framework of the Quad. Well, uh, the agenda of Quad as of today is more of a uh, development, uh, vaccine, technology sharing, uh, etc. And India has reiterated number of times that Quad is not a security or defense alliance. Uh, anyway, now we have a new initiative called AUKUS that is uh, Australia, UK and US. Uh, it appears uh, like a super body over Quad. Uh, so where does it leave Quad? What do you think? I think that you mentioned AUKUS. Actually, I think that uh, recently there are two incidents, two two two, uh, two happenings. India should uh, learn lessons. One is the uh, Afghanistan issue that is U.S. withdraw its, its troops, harsh uh, in, in harsh and without the uh, uh, consideration of the its its U.S. Uh, EU uh, allies and even all the the, the other. Or including India's uh, concerns. The other issue is the AUKUS you've mentioned. I think that uh, look at the, what happens between the U.S. and the France relationship. So I think that that France as a U.S. US ally still suffered from U.S. US first policy. So I think that the US, uh, India should uh, take some kind of lessons from these two kind of the happenings recently. As to the AUKUS itself, I think that uh, it's quite dangerous because from the non-proliferation uh, perspective, the India, uh, the US and the UK, they as two nuclear uh, countries, they send some kind of the nuclear submarine to the Australia. So, but the, the, what, it will have some very serious uh, effect on the, uh, on the overall non-proliferation uh, mechanisms. For example, if someday China or the other countries, China or, or, or Russia, we also agree to send our submarine to other countries, right? So I think that when, when, when the U.S. always send, emphasize the rule-based, rule of law, actually, U.S. should abide by the rules first. Why have they, uh, now Quad is a reality, and India is likely to play a very active role in, in Indo-Pacific as well as in Quad. So will it affect India's role in other uh, multilateral or regional uh, groupings such as uh, BRICS, uh, SCA, SCO and BCM? India is quite important in the, uh, the, the, uh, in the forums you've mentioned, such like the SCO or, or the BRICS. Uh, and uh, I, I think just just a few days ago, India hosted the uh, BRICS summit successfully yeah. and uh, released the uh, New Delhi Declaration. But I think it's a quite it's a challenge for India to balance India's role in in, in the in court 
or the uh, U.S. led organizations, and also the the other countries in uh, com, com, consist mainly of the developing or regional countries. It's a it's a challenge for the Indian side. I hope India can tackle the balance issue very well. Uh, but I think that Indian side should uh, quite clear that the, the regional countries or the these mechanisms such like the ACO the or the BRICS have already made much progress in addressing the developing issue, in addressing the regional hard issues. So I think that uh, uh, as long as India maintains the non-alignment or strategic autonomy you have mentioned in this case, then it will be quite, uh, it will be more uh, acceptable. But if you just, uh, I mean, take the, uh, make the, make India's entry in the SCO or the BRICS as a guise to uh, non uh, strategic autonomy or non alignment is not ideologically driven or China targeted. Mm -hmm. I think it will be understandable mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. India is rising. Mm -hmm. I, I want to emphasize that add one sentence that is, we are really concerned that Indians' vision on the Indo Pacific will be hijacked by the US. Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, as you know, the new developments in Afghanistan, uh, the unrest in Afghanistan is, is dangerous uh, to not only India and China, but the whole region and, and maybe the world. Uh, and China is likely to play an important role in Afghanistan. You know, India has worked a lot in Afghanistan. They have done a lot of developmental work in Afghanistan for a long time. Uh, whether this is education, training, hospitals or infrastructure and even making their parliament. Now China and India can be very good partners to work towards Afghanistan development. So do you think there is a scope of India and China to work together in Afghanistan? I think that both uh, China and India, made the, the leaders of the, all the countries has made this kind of consensus. So, but I think that there are also some challenges that is one big challenge is India's policy towards Afghanistan, where the India will adjust your policy to Afghanistan from a, a more, I mean, a inclusive or accommodative perspective that is linked to your attitude towards the Taliban. So I think that now Taliban is, a, is undeniable, it's quite important power in Afghanistan. So I think that uh, uh, both China and uh, uh, India, we have many areas to cooperate. At least we have this kind of the consensus to, main, to try to help the Afghan people to, to, have, to maintain peace and stability. But there are some challenges such like the, uh, I've mentioned the Indian's attitudes or policy towards Afghanistan or Taliban. And also uh, what we can do to prevent the humanitarian uh, crisis in, uh, in, in, in Afghanistan and what China and India can do to make the international community, particularly including the U.S., to make more responsible role in Afghanistan. So because now the U.S., uh, I think that uh, sanctioned foreign reserve and also uh, didn't allow the IMF or, or the WB to, to, to send it uh, some some kind of the uh, the fund package to Afghanistan. So I think it's bad for the Afghanistan government, bad for the Afghanistan society or people to to have uh, to 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 live a normal life. So th I think that China and India or the other countries, including the Russia, Pakistan, SEO uh, members or, or the Iran, that is to try to maintain the peace and the uh, prosperity in Afghanistan to, to support the Afghanistan people to live a normal life after the withdrawal of the U.S. And we should argue for the international community to provide more humanitarian uh, support to the in, uh, Afghanistan support. We should not view the Afghanistan issue from the geopolitical or geostrategic perspective. Otherwise, there are many lessons, I think, that uh, for, for, for U.S., of course, and also, frankly speaking, there are also lessons for India or regional countries. 
So we should not view the African issue from the political perspective. The peace and the stability of the African issue is good for the whole world and particularly for the regional countries. Well, India will have to change its, its, its instance on, 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 on Taliban since they are ruling Afghanistan now. But as you know, Pakistan is a crucial pillar in Afghanistan uh, today. So will China be willing to work together with India irrespective of what Pakistan thinks? When Indian side views the Afghanistan issue from the Pakistan perspective, it uh, itself will make some kind of obstacles for the, for the uh, regional countries' cooperation in the Afghanistan issue. So I think that China supports any, uh, from my, uh, in my own capacity, I think that China supports all the countries' help it help towards the Afghanistan government and the society. <laughs> of course, now the Afghanistan issue is still in turmoil, and the, in, uh, the, the, the Taliban government faced many challenges, economic development, social, inclusive social uh, uh, accommodation yeah. policy, or it itself, I think that there are some, I, I think it itself needs to uh, make some kind of adjustment because when you fight in, when you, it's quite different when you are in power and not in power. So I think that the, all the regional countries should try to communicate with the Taliban, the other factions of the uh, Afghanistan that are try to uh, establish the um, inclusive government. Mm -hmm. And then they try to set up the inclusive government and the, all the neighboring countries should not make use of the Afghanistan divided domestic factions for its own sake. I think all the other all the regional countries should make joint efforts, send a clear signal that uh, Afghanistan, the Afghanistan's future is Afghan people, is decided by the Afghanistan people and all the neighboring countries are willing to provide all the help yeah. instead of make the Afghanistan issue as a card against each other. Okay, now, uh, let me just ask you the last question. Uh, you know, post-Galwan, India-China relations have, relationship have gone to the lowest. Uh, India seeks a status quo ante, while Chinese seems to suggest that uh, partial disengagement has happened and uh, let's move on other issues while continue talking on, on, on Galwan issues and the border. Uh, now, there is a kind of impasse. So where do we go from here? How do we move forward and resume normal relationship? What will you suggest to our governments? I think that uh, the most important thing is for both China and India to, is that uh, to fulfill the strategic, strategic, strategic consensus that is reached by both leaders. Just now you also mentioned that the Prime Minister Modi is also willing very eager to have a positive relationship with China. So I think that uh, the most important thing nowadays is to fulfill the two leaders' consensus. It's quite important because if you look at the, uh, the history of the bilateral relationship, China and India bilateral relationship, you will notice that uh, this bilateral relationship to much extent is, is defined by the top level, by the top leaders. So if we, as long as we can fulfill the two, uh, the, the leaders consensus, it will be quite positive for our bilateral countries to move forward. And the second is that the key word I think is decoupling or de de decoupling. That is decoupling the board issue or the territorial dispute with the overall bilateral relationship. Decoupling the economic cooperation with the strategic or security mistrust or competition, decoupling the, 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 our bilateral relationship with the, our relationship with the other countries. We should focus on the good side of good aspects of our bilateral relationship. The issues will, will be there. It's quite normal for the two countries, for the two big countries, such like China and India, we have some kind of the the, the issues or cause is quite, uh, quite natural, but the most important thing that we should be confident 
on the future of our bilateral relationship. And we should stick to the right track for our bilateral relationship. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Lau. It was indeed a pleasure talking to you and, and you have given some uh, interesting insights into India-China relationship. Thank you so much. Xie Xie. Thanks, Sati.